Hi everyone, today we're going to take a look at how standing waves can form as a result of the reflection of traveling waves. Now this is a fairly widely covered topic, it's a standard topic in physics textbooks and videos and things like that. However, there are certain uh, aspects of this that I think tend to get skimmed over a little bit, which I think are actually quite important. For example, the effects of multiple reflections. So I'm going to be saying a little bit about that towards the end. So I have on the screen an x-axis I've marked on the position where x equals zero. and we're going to imagine setting up a wave traveling along this x-axis. It could be any type of wave, sound wave, electromagnetic wave or whatever, but maybe it's easiest to visualize this as a string with a little vibration generator connected to one end of the string at that place where x is equal to zero. So let's denote the transverse displacement of that string by y. And because it's going to be much easier to do this entire treatment using complex numbers rather than just sines and cosines, I'm going to define y to be the real part of some other variable, which you could call like the complex displacement, uh, I'll call that z. And so in practice, we're going to be mostly working with z. Just remember that at the end, we need to take the real part of z in order to find the actual physical solution y. Now, when you turn on your vibration generator at x equals zero, that's going to cause a traveling wave to start propagating towards the right. So mathematically, you can describe a traveling wave moving to the right um, like this with your, in terms of your complex displacement z, it's going to be some constant, which is a complex number, let's call it a, multiplied by e to the i times omega t minus uh, kx. So omega here is the angular frequency with which you're sort of forcing that string, right, angular frequency of the vibration generator, and k um, is the wave number of the wave that's going to propagate along, which is determined both by the frequency that you're driving the string at and the speed of waves on the string. So now let's place a fixed boundary, imagine clamping the string down at some particular value of x, which I'm going to call L for, well, length of the string. Now, what's going to happen when your traveling wave reaches L is that it's going to reflect back, and we need a mathematical way to describe that reflection. So let me just draw an L wave, which is reflected back. Let's describe that by z equals some other amplitude b. For now, we don't know how it's related to a, but just some amplitude multiplied by e to the i. Now, because this is now a left traveling wave, we've got to change our minus sign into a plus sign. So it's i times omega t plus kx. So now let's use the principle of superposition to find out what the overall wave on our string is now. So if we add together the two waves that we've got so far, notice that they both contain a factor of e to the i omega t. So we could factorize that out and write our overall complex displacement as e to the i omega t times, well, from the right traveling wave, you've got a e to the minus ikx, then from your left traveling wave, you've got plus be to the positive ikx. Now you can use some boundary conditions to establish a relationship between a and b. In particular, we said that l was a fixed end, right? Like the string has been clamped down there. So that means your displacement and therefore your complex displacement at that point where x is equal to l always has to be zero. So z evaluated at any time, but at a position of l has to be zero. So we can take our general expression for z from the previous line and see what happens. Now, firstly, notice that e to the i omega t is never zero. And so we can just divide through by e to the i omega t. Um, then basically that implies that the bracketed term has to be zero. Now, if that's zero, then that means that b e to the power of i k l has to be minus a e to the power of minus IKL. That guarantees the bracket to term is zero. Then you just uh, divide through by e to the IKL and you can get B in terms of A. So B is going to be minus A uh, e to the power of minus two IKL. So let's substitute that back into our equation for Z and simplify as much as possible. So Z is now going to be, well, we can factor out an A and get A e to the I omega t in front of our brackets. Then our bracketed term is going to be, well, the first term is now just e to the minus ikx. The second term now gets a minus sign from that b, uh, and it also affects your complex exponent. Right now, instead of just ikx, you've got ik times x minus 2l. And there's one more thing we can do to make this look a little bit more nice and symmetrical. So notice that you can factorize out an additional uh, e to the minus ikl. If we do that, then your, well, the exponent of your prefactor is e to the i omega t minus kl. Now, because we've done that, you have to adjust the two complex exponentials in the brackets. Your first one now has to be e to the minus ik times 
x minus l because we took out a minus ikl right so you need to have an additional e to the positive ikl there to sort of cancel that out now for the second term you initially had uh, well a factor of two ikl in your second complex exponent we've taken one of those out now and so that basically just means we can get rid of that two there right and so this second part is going to be e to the i k times x minus l now notice that the exponents of your two complex exponentials here now only differ by a minus sign which means um, if you use the fact that e to the power of i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta you can prove that that bracketed term is minus 2i times the sine of k times x minus l okay so this entire thing simplifies quite nicely to minus 2ia you've still got this time varying complex exponential at the beginning so e to the i omega t minus kl but then you just get this nice sine of k x minus l there now at this point we've actually already shown that a standing wave is formed because what's happened is the x's and the t's have separated out from each other if you imagine taking the real part of this expression for z that we've got down there um, all of the stuff in front of that sine term is just going to give you some uh, sinusoidally varying expression with time there's going to be some phase factor in there that comes from the a and the e to the minus i k l and so on but it's just going to be some sinusoidally varying function in time multiplied by some sinusoidally varying function in space and that's exactly a standing wave right it's not moving anywhere overall however what we haven't said anything about so far is the possibility of multiple reflections right you've got your wave going from zero to l then the reflective wave coming back from l to zero but then when the reflection gets back to zero in principle you could have another reflection right another reflected wave which i could represent here as let's say c e to the i omega t minus kx because that's going to travel to the right um, and so we need to consider how that third wave might affect our standing wave pattern. So to do that, let's think about boundary conditions again. So I'm just going to write down here to show what we're doing. We're now considering the second reflection, the reflection of the reflection. Now, the boundary condition at x equals 0 is different from the boundary condition at x equals L, because at 0, you're actually physically moving the string up and down. So there isn't zero displacement there. Now, the original wave, because it was a e to the i omega t minus kx, must have come from a vibration from your vibration generator uh, described by just a e to the i omega t so your boundary condition uh, at x equals zero is actually that z should be a e to the i omega t in total now what we can set that equal to is the z that we found so far right that standing wave added on to this new um, second reflection wave right now the most convenient form to use i think is actually not going to be the sine form uh, that we had down there but this one over here which i'm writing uh, marking on with an arrow uh, so if you plug in x equals zero into that expression you're going to get it's equal to a e to the i omega t um, and then the first term right this e to the minus i k x just becomes one because the exponent is zero the second term is minus e to the minus two i k l now we have to add on to that our newly reflected wave which is this c term over here if we plug in x equals zero to that we get just c e to the i omega t now if you divide everything through by e to the i omega t and expand those brackets you're going to get a equals a minus a e to the minus 2 i k l plus c and this simplifies just to c is a e to the minus 2 i k l so this tells you how your second reflected wave um, the amplitude of that wave depends on the original amplitude it just differs by a phase factor of e to the minus 2 i k l so in general what's going to happen is that your first wave goes to x equals l as this as that first reflected wave comes back to x equals zero you set up a standing wave however in order to satisfy the boundary condition at x equals zero as soon as your first reflection gets back to x equals zero a third wave or a second reflected wave has to be emitted again now that second reflection may or may not be in phase with the original wave right because it just differs by this phase factor here now in general if if it's not in phase if it's got some arbitrary phase difference compared with your original wave then you are going to get some overall wave pattern which is basically a bit of a mess right it's not going to be a perfect standing wave um, and you're going to get something with which varies both spatially and temporarily in a very complicated way.
Now, if there's no damping, then there are really going to be infinitely many reflections, right? Because that C wave is going to go over to X equals L, and it's going to be reflected back, and that can just keep happening if there's no damping. And so in general, you're going to get this very complicated wave pattern. However, what about if your C wave ends up being perfectly in phase with your A wave, that original wave, right? Because then basically you have this exact same process going on again and again, and each cycle of this process is going to just reinforce the same pattern on the wave. That's basically what a standing wave is. So in other words, in order to keep your standing wave pattern going forever, right, rather than just for one cycle of this process, you need all of those waves to reinforce each other rather than interfere in some complicated way. So what's the condition for all of the waves to reinforce each other? Well, it's basically that C has to be the same as A, right? Then C is going to be perfectly, the C wave will be perfectly in phase with the A wave. Uh, that will happen if e to the minus 2i kl is just equal to 1. And what that implies about the exponent is that it, it has to be a an integer multiple of 2 pi, right? So in other words, 2 kl is equal to 2 pi n, where n is some integer. I guess really it's got to be a, a positive integer because k and l themselves should both be positive. Um, that result follows from thinking about an argand diagram, right? The phase of your, in order to get one, the phase of your uh, complex exponential has to be zero or two pi, because by the time you've rotated through by two pi, you've gone back to the same starting point. Now we can visualize what this means by remembering that k, the wave number, uh, is two pi over the wavelength lambda of your wave. So this says that two times two pi over lambda times L is two pi times an integer. And you can rearrange that um, to show that n lambda over 2 is equal to the length of the string L. So in words, what this is saying is that you can fit on a whole number of half wavelengths onto the length L of your string. Um, just to sketch out one particular example of that, if n was equal to 2, that's saying you, you're fitting on two half wavelengths of your wave onto the string. So that would look something like this. The resulting wave pattern would look like that. But you could have, let me draw another one just as an example. If n was 3, then you're fitting on three half wavelengths onto your string. And so you'd get something like that, 1, 2, and 3. So what's going to happen when this condition is satisfied is that all of these multiply reflected waves will reinforce the wave pattern instead of just causing a some sort of mess of a, of a wave shape. Um, there will be always be some damping in reality, of course, right? So if there's no damping, this the idea would be that you could get an infinite amplitude eventually uh, as all these waves reinforce each other. Of course, they're actually going to be losing some of their energy as they propagate along the wave. And so you'll reach eventually reach some steady state where the energy input by the vibration generator is equal to the energy being dissipated due to the string uh, being damped. This is why if you uh, if you search, you'll be able to find videos of uh, a vibration generator on a string, basically exactly this setup where your vibration generator has a tiny amplitude, um, but it ends up creating a standing wave of a much bigger amplitude than the vibrations themselves. So let's finish up by writing down an expression for the, well, the overall displacement of your, your standing wave y. Um, that's going to come from taking the real part of this z expression down here. Now, it's going to be hard to come up with an actual expression for the final amplitude of the standing wave, because as we were just discussing, it'll depend on how much damping there is, uh, and that gets pretty complicated. So I'm just going to write a proportionality sign here, show that we don't really know the, the amplitude. Um, but when we take the real part of that z, the temporal dependence is basically coming from that e to the i omega t. Um, so I'm going to write down cos of omega t. There could in general be some phase there, phi, because remember, a is a complex number that contains some phase information, which will be combined with this uh, minus 2i and the e to the i kl. So there'll be some general phase factor that will depend on the phase of the uh, the vibration generator. And then what's going to happen with this sine term? Well, under the conditions for standing wave formation, we know that right from this relationship here, kl is equal to n pi. And so the kl, right, the kl term when you expand the brackets in the argument of the sine, is n pi, but sine of n pi is just zero. And so the sine term just ends up being um, sine of kx. Or equivalently, you could use that circled equation to write instead of k, you could say that k is just n pi over l, where n can be an integer uh, multiplied by x. Okay, so thank you for watching. I hope you've learned something about standing waves and multiple reflections. 
um, and I will see you again soon.